we're going to head towards a world where these sensors on our body, in our body, in our clothing, in the chair of our desk, in our beds are monitoring everything 24 seven and all of it's being ingested into an AI that is looking for slight little clues, right? I think the ultimate tricorder is a myriad of sensors that are in our environment. Audio assistants like Alexa, Google Now and, and Siri and so forth are able to listen to the quality of your voice or if you cough, what the cough sounds like. And all of this is massive data that's going to be plowing into our you know, 24 seven diagnostics. So I think this is the decade that we completely reinvent healthcare. Today, I'm extremely excited and honored to have a, a chance to speak in person with someone that I've had the opportunity to spend some time with unexpectedly over the past year and um, who I admire and have admired for as long as I can really remember thinking about technology. And uh, someone who's now an engineer and has had a chance to work in a few of the industries that Peter talks a lot about, um, I can say that he has predicted many of the trends that I got a chance to be a part of, which was quite exciting. So, uh, Peter, thank you for joining us. I'm really excited for the conversation. Hey, Josh. Pleasure to be here. A fan of what uh, what you and your team have been building at Levels, uh, a user of it, and uh, someone who thinks the technology is uh, important for our increasing health span. Well, I think, uh, you know, given where you've invested your time and attention, uh, you, you really do mean those words. And, and that's uh, something that I really appreciate as well. Um, your support has been tremendous as we're working on levels. But, you know, I think I want to just kind of start off because this is a very interesting moment in time. And uh, your most recent book, which was released in 2020, called The Future is Faster Than You Think, How Converging Technologies Are Transforming Business, Industries, and Our Lives. So this is a little excerpt from that. There's little doubt that the decade to come will be filled with radical breakthroughs and world-changing surprises. Every major industry on our planet is about to be completely reimagined. For entrepreneurs, for innovators, for leaders, for anyone sufficiently nimble and adventurous, the opportunities will be incredible. It will be both a future that's faster than you think and arguably the greatest display of imagination rendered visible the world has yet seen. Welcome to an era of extraordinary. Um, I love that because it was from 2020. And what you were kind of predicting there is that we might see or would see a repeat that, that would be even more fantastic and amazing than what happened 100 years earlier with the Roaring Twenties, which are um, you know kind of the, the moment in time where radio, automobiles, airplanes, refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, we just saw this explosion of technology and the transformation of lives. And so I'm a big proponent of this. I, I love the idea of a new Roaring Twenties. It is. <laughs> I now. love it too. <laughs> well, what's amazing is at this very moment, there are two things that just happened essentially. And I, I really want to talk to, to you about these because they're so relevant to, to this statement and this uh, prediction. The first one is on November 30th, uh, OpenAI, which is a company producing AI tools, they released a new tool called ChatGPT. So the way I've been describing it is this tool is not general artificial intelligence, but it is absolutely the first generally useful artificial intelligence. I, I would love to just hear from you. Like, what, what are your thoughts on this thing? Elon's calling it scary good. Yeah, I think Scary Good's a great, a great example of it. So if folks haven't tried Chat GPT, it is on, it's built by OpenAI, which is a, a company that's run by Sam Altman. It was funded in part by Elon Musk. Uh, Microsoft's invested a billion dollars. You may know it for uh, GPT and Dolly and Dolly 2, but Chat GPT is a generative search engine, um, so to speak. You ask it a question and it doesn't give you a link on the web to an answer, you know, typically what, what we think of as Google. It actually goes on the web and it synthesizes and gives you an answer. So this morning I was doing a, my, one of the podcasts, I, I have a podcast called Moonshots and Mindsets. And, um, I was doing a podcast on, on Bitcoin with, uh, with Anthony Pompliano. And so just for fun, I went on to, on to uh, chat GPT and I said, what are the five uh, most recognized benefits of Bitcoin? And it, it wrote me this beautiful page long list of five and why each one was in fact. And I said, what are the five major risks that people are concerned about with Bitcoin? And he, and he gave me, gave me that. 
Uh, another example is a friend of mine. We were on a X Prize board meeting, and 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 he went and the it's all about the prompt. It's like what what is the question you ask and how do you ask it? And so he said, write a poem about uh, X Prize uh, helping uplift humanity or something like that. And it wrote this incredible poem. It was like, I mean, if you you would have hired a poet and you know spent some amount of money, I'm not sure how <laughs> much poets get paid, right. but, uh, and waited, you know, a day or so, and you got something back for free in, uh, you know, in a millisecond. Um, people have used it for, uh, you know, design advice for their home. And then you can take the output of, of chat GPT, which is, uh, words, sentences, paragraphs, and you can then put it into uh, Stable Diffusion uh, or Dolly uh, and have it create a visual uh, representation. If you're, you know, I saw mm -hmm. someone who was like, I want to create a living room that's super, you know, fanciful and open mm -hmm. and bright, you know, and it said, write me a description of what that room would be like. And it wrote this long description and then, and then it used, I don't know if it was Stable Diffusion or uh, what it was, but it generated these photorealistic images of the rooms. And it's like, holy shit, that's amazing. Incredible visuals. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I have two 11 year old boys and uh, this thing is going to destroy <laughs> a, stool, a teacher's ability to give kids homework because, right. you know, it's like, write me an essay about this or here's the math, math question. You put it in and it will answer it for you. So, I mean, it's a it's a fascinating uh, future that is moving super fast, right? I mean, to come back to levels, uh, the other thing you can you can do is you can say, here's the here's the component. This is what I have in my refrigerator. I want to have a low glycemic dinner. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you recommend you cook? I, I cook for myself. I mean, it's exactly. that that scary crazy. You know, it can give you those personalized recipes. I did the exact same thing. Like, here are my ingredients. I have this. I have thirty minutes. Give me something personalized. It can do that. It can teach you calculus at at whatever pace works best for you. I mean, it can debug and write code. It, it's it's really like this thing shook me when I when I tried it for the first time and I spent yeah. some time with it. And uh, you know, I really want to dive into some of the implications there, but I also want to tee up the second of the two big changes that have happened. You know, I think I think it's safe to say that anyone I know who cares a little bit about technology has been surprised at chat GPT, right? But what is the next one that I'm really excited about is um, this hasn't even really happened, but tomorrow the U S department of energy is set to announce that researchers at Lawrence Livermore national lab have demonstrated net energy in a fusion experiment, right? So this is nuclear fusion energy. This is something that you Peter have been talking about forever, but that scientists have been chasing for literally decades. Yes. And according to financial times, they have they have achieved this experiment, but what what's about to happen? Yeah, so I've read the articles and um, I've been tracking uh, fusion now. I mean, listen, fu the the joke about fusion is it's the technology of tomorrow, and it's always been fifty years away, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's the you know fusion. What is fusion? It's the combination of hydrogen atoms to form helium. Uh, it's the reaction that goes into the sun. And when you put two protons and two hydrogen atoms together to form a helium nucleus, uh, there is a small amount of the mass that is converted into energy, according to Einstein's famous equation, e equal mc squared. But since, you know, c, the speed of light, is so big, a uh, little bit of m makes a lot of e. <laughs> so uh, right. the, our sun is a fusion reactor that's 93 million miles away, and all of solar energy is based upon uh you know, the fusion reaction in the sun. So, you know, people have for decades uh, said, I don't want nuclear power. And we have, I mean, it's a shame because nuclear's gotten such a bad name from Fukushima, Three Mile Island, um, uh, uh, Chernobyl, mm -hmm. you know, the three most famous failures. But those were old style nuclear reactors and they were fission based reactors where you're taking uranium and splitting it uh, to make into smaller nuclear atomic number uh, atoms. And again, in that process of splitting it, some, some mass goes into energy, but it's 
it's radioactive. Uh, the containment of that is radioactive. The products are radioactive. The uranium is radioactive. And so you, you have a lot of waste. Um, and it's a shame because the new generation of fission reactors are fail safe. When they fail, they're still safe. And I, I think we've been decommissioning reactors and stopping them, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. But the good news is fusion is not radioactive. You don't get a radioactive byproduct. You get just energy. Um, and the potential is, you know, I talk about an abundance of energy. What we have the potential for here is a squanderable abundance of energy. Uh, and we know there's a direct correlation between the amount of energy a community, a nation, or the world has, and its economic prosperity. So when we went, you know, energy in the world used to be muscle, it used to be human muscle, and then oxen and horses. And then we went to uh, water wheels, um, powering our grain mills, and then we went to coal, and then oil and natural gas and now solar. But fusion reactors, once they're up and operating, and the prediction has been for a while now that we would see net positive fusion reactions. So we've been able to have fusion for a while now. It was very short duration, and it was not putting out as much energy as you put in. It was, uh, it was net energy negative. And the holy grail has been going to net energy positive. And what we just heard was we're going to have that announcement tomorrow that it's been achieved. And so with that in hand, the potential is to provide energy anywhere and everywhere in the world. And these fusion reactors, the cost of the energy production is de minimis and they can operate 24 seven safely in a community. And, and that's a big, big deal. Yeah. Thank you for, for summarizing that history, because that that's exactly where I wanted to go is just, um, you know, fusion has been, on the, the table, sort of in the background for so long now. It, it was the, the hot thing for, for decades, I'm sure. But in my life, it's been, it's kind of just dismissed as, um, you know, you might as well call it cold fusion, which is where you, you don't even need to manage incredible heat and temperatures. But, um, you know, with, with this announcement, I think what you just described, the, the abundance concept, it, it sort of breaks our brains to imagine having enough energy that you can ethically and morally waste it. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, uh, my my parents were always like, turn off the lights, don't leave the lights on, you know. Now, listen, there's still going to be energy costs. Uh, there's still going to be the cost of of transmitting and, and managing the um, uh, the reactors and all. But uh, the potential is for generating energy anywhere on the planet and what's called baseload, right? And not only just peak energy. Um, anyway, it's, it's incredibly powerful. And with minimal byproducts. Yeah. You know, I think the, um, the confluence of these two things just in, in this moment in time, it, you know, like I said, we, we talked about chat GPT, which again has an unassuming name, but what it, what I think it represents is the potential for abundance of information in a, in a useful, in a, in an immediately useful format. So you don't have to take a, you know, a Google link and read a reference that is formatted for an entirely different audience and then try to contextualize it for yourself it is distributed to you in exactly the format you asked for. And then that abundance of information combined with the potential for in the next few years, an abundance of energy. And I'm just curious, you know, this, this is, these are exponential technology predictions you made a long time ago. Is this something that you, you see actually happening? Are we about to see this revolution over the next few years? Oh, we have this... so many more revolutions coming. It's not funny. Um, <laughs> uh, and listen, when, there's a moment in time where something becomes possible and then a moment in time when it becomes distributed, right? The old uh, William Gibson who says, you know, the future is already here. It's just not, you know, equally distributed. So uh, ChatGPT, by the way, uh, has gone from zero to a million users in five days. And, you know, that is the fastest growth of any product out there ever. Uh, you know, I think Facebook went from zero to a million users in like a year or two years. And we see the speed at which this stuff is accelerating is really is incredible. But AI is coming. Um, and we've seen just a peak under the, the covers, right? We're going to have some version of Jarvis. And I bring it back to, uh, to health. Uh, you know, we're going to have an AI that you give permission to watch what you eat. 
uh, to listen to your conversations, to monitor your blood chemistries, you know, the future versions of, of levels technology that's not only monitoring uh, blood glucose, but, um, you know, 30 other parameters and all that data is uploaded to your AI constantly and your AI is advising you on, on what to eat. Uh, maybe eventually your robot chef is making things that it knows you enjoy, but is optimized for what your blood chemistry is at the moment. You know, you need more vitamin D, you need more, you know, you know, certain proteins. I mean, that's an exciting future that is coming. The other thing we've seen recently, um, you know, if you're looking for the best of 2022 in the exponential tech world, uh, is we saw Optimus uh, announced Tesla bot. Uh, this is a humanoid robot uh, that was unveiled and uh, is supposedly going to be less than the cost of a car under $20,000. But, you know, imagine a, a humanoid robot powered by AI that can go and do the things you need, you know, go rake the leaves, go and fix the, the leaky sink, go shopping and grab me food. I mean, it's a it's a future of uh, of robotic labor to a large degree. We also, I as you mentioned, I'm the founder executive chairman of the X Prize Foundation, and we just uh, announced the winner of the our Avatar X Prize. And these are robotic avatars where the robot's not autonomous. There is a human driver at a distance uh, on a, with a VR helmet and a haptic suit operating inside the robot at a distance someplace. And so that's that's here, massive growth in the whole biotech uh, gene editing, writing, reading world. Amazing. It's moving so fast. And I think, you know, many of us recognize those, um, the avatar as sort of a mechatronic suit sort of configuration, yes. which- I can't wait <laughs> for, for them to be battling each other. <laughs> right, exactly. I want to get to the healthcare stuff in, in a minute, but I just want to look back a little bit, you know, because this, this next, we'll say this next decade plays out the way we hope. And, and we see true exponential technologies um, hitting the, the knee, right. And, and going vertical because we have this long linear growth pattern in an exponential technology. And then all of a sudden it, it seems to go crazy overnight. And we might be at that inflection point with a few things. What do you think about the last decade? So Last decade, a lot of people I talked to, they, they kind of describe it as it, it known for the rise of social media, for, for software as a service companies, you know, where you're like solving an increasingly niche problem for an increasingly niche subset of an industry, um, e-commerce getting large. Um, you know, we also saw some impressive stuff. We saw DNA sequencing go exponential. We saw AI technology crack protein folding. We saw reusable rockets, uh, electronics and ph photonics. So the iPhone, you know, and the, and the miniaturization of things. H how do you think about the last decade? How will you talk about it? I think the last decade was super exciting. So I, you know, I, I run a uh, a CEO entrepreneur uh, year long executive program called Abundance Three Hundred and Sixty. It's the highest tier level of of Singularity University, and I've been running it now for eleven years. So every year for the last eleven years, I go into the program and I talk about. Uh, I contextualize it by saying, okay. What was, what was the world like a hundred years ago? And by the way, a hundred years ago, the speed of technological uh, uh, progress was molasses. I mean, if you look <laughs> at the breakthroughs, like in the year 1915, 1916 through 1922, it's like, it's hilarious. It's like Vegemite was invented, was a breakthrough in, in, <laughs> in 20, in 1921, the water ski was invented with a board and some rope. That was a breakthrough wow. in the year 19. I kid you not. I mean, that's wow. the kind of stuff. And I searched high and low. And typically it's like five, six, seven things that, that occurred over the course of the entire year that are that you don't even think of as a breakthrough. So that's one thing I've been doing for the last decade. And then I would look a year a year back and then I would look, you know, three or four years forward. And every year I can guarantee you because I can put myself back in that mindset. Every year was exciting. Hmm. Every year was like, wow, we've just had some amazing things occur. And we're just jaded now at what those amazing <laughs> things were, right? Whether it was, uh, you know, getting, you know, a drone on Mars or, or uh, Falcon 9, you know, returning its first 
uh, stage to a successful landing and then and then Falcon Heavy, I mean, and then going yeah. to the space station. I mean, amazing things over the last uh, decade. And one of the things I'm clear about is that the next decade, what we're going to see in the next 10 years, and I'm, I'm putting out at this very moment a, uh, a meta trend series where I mm. have looked at the top 20 meta trends for the year uh, 2023 through 2033. And folks can go to diamandis.com um, and uh, you'll have a chance to get my blog and the meta trend there. Um, but when I look at these at these at the next decade, we're going to make as much progress in the next 10 years as we have in the entire past century. That's the speed of the acceleration of the curve. And so it's hard to think about how fast things are getting. Um, and it's going to be AI and biotech and to some degree robotics that are leading the pack. And I haven't even mentioned what's going to come down the pack with quantum computing. Right. Right. Um, one of the things at, at A360 this year is uh, I've got a guy named Jack Hittery, who's the CEO of Sandbox AQ, which spun out of Alphabet. It's their mm -hmm. quantum technologies play. Eric Schmitz the CEO, uh, is, the, is the chairman. Jack is the CEO. And uh, I've had a preview of what we're going to be discussing on stage, and it's insane. It's mm -hmm. quantum technologies, quantum compute, quantum chemistry is going to be the revolution that makes medicine and biotech uh in the future look like today is standing still this is the nature of big numbers and exponential functions is that our brains can't do that we, we weren't designed to uh to do this and, and one way to capture that uh which I, I really love this quote is you can you often over predict what you can do in a short time and under predict what you can do in a long time and that, that's essentially what we're talking about here it's like we For can sure. get you know we get frustrated with trying to pay bills and, you know, the, these antiquated systems and the DMV and all this stuff. But if you can zoom out and look at what you just said, more progress in the next 10 years than in the past 100 and think about what life was like in 1922. To give yeah. people some ways of thinking about this, our brains evolved uh, 100,000 years ago to a million years ago, back when the world was local and linear. Nothing, of, nothing that affected us was not within a day's walk. Mm. Um, and the world didn't change, you know, year to year or decade to decade or century to century. It really was pretty much constant. The life of your great, 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 great grandparents and life of your great, great grandchildren was pretty much the same back then. And uh, our brains, 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synaptic connections evolved to understand that world. We're linear thinkers. Uh, what was really important to us is your crossing a prairie and you see a lion there. And the question was, could I get to that tree before the lion got to me? That was, and that's linear, that's linear physics. Uh, today it is not linear. Today it's, you know, you double something, you know, so if you double, if you, if you take 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, 30 linear steps, you're 30 meters away. If you do 30 exponential steps, where an exponential is a simple doubling, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, in 30 doublings, you're not 30 meters away, you're a billion meters away. You've gone around the planet 26 times. And it's that disconnect between us as linear thinkers and this exponential world that really uh, catches people by surprise. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's um, you know, what's interesting about it is that when talking about these sorts of concepts, and I, I will say, you know, I, I don't know the number of times you've been vindicated, vindicated on your predictions because I, I don't have a full catalog, but I'm sure you're keeping score somewhere. But, um, you know, <laughs> I think really, I, but <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. And, and listen, I have to give credit where credit's due. You know, uh, one of my mentors is Ray Kurzweil, mm -hmm. uh, who's one of the great thinkers in this world. Uh, he's written numerous books, uh, including The Singularity is Near. He's my co-founder of Singularity University. And really, I've learned from him, and uh, he's been an extraordinary friend, co-conspirer, co-founder, and mentor. Highly recommend reading anything he puts out as well. It's it's really interesting stuff, and um, you know, I think again, proven to be, although sometimes unpredictable on on timing, but very very prescient in terms of what we're trying we're seeing roll out. I think one thing I, I'd like to ask is that you've been making these 
predictions and, and deep in the future of technology for a long time. And inherently that attracts skeptics, people who, who don't see the world in an abundant sort of mindset and don't see the world in an opportunistic or an op, really an optimistic way. Sure. And what I'm curious about from your perspective is whether, like, how do you see yourself? Do, do you see yourself as sort of a missionary who, who should change the minds of people who don't believe these things? Or are you seeking to primarily coalesce and inspire and motivate people who, who do see things similarly, but feel like demotivated by the pressure? That's a great question. What I see myself as is someone who is passionate about getting entrepreneurs to think bigger. Hmm. Um, I think entrepreneurs are the means by which we solve the world's grand challenges. I like to say that the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. And if you want to become a billionaire, help a billion people, right? It's that hmm. kind of alignment. And I'm, I believe that we have the ability given the tools that we're inheriting, uh, what you and I have been talking about for the last 20 minutes uh, to up our dreams. And so my mission is to incentivize entrepreneurs to take bigger moonshots, uh, to take on solving the world's biggest problems, do something that scares you and inspires you and has the enable and ability to make a dent in the universe um, because that leaves the world a better place. So I think my responsibility is inspiring and guiding entrepreneurs. So I do that through Abundance 360. I do that through my venture fund, Bold Capital. I do that through my podcast. Uh, I do that through um, all of my, my companies, through Singularity University, um, through the X prizes that we launch. is all about giving entrepreneurs a big target and saying, mm -hmm. I don't care where you went to school, what you've ever done before. If you can solve this problem, you win the money and the world gets that benefit. So, um, I think part of what I'm looking to do, Josh, is also change people's mindsets. You know, mm -hmm. I, I say this all the time and, and it is so deeply true for me that your mindset is the most important thing you have. Um, yeah. and you know, if you look at what were the greatest leaders and entrepreneurs, what did they have that made a difference for them? Was it their cash, their technology, their relationships or their mindset? I hope most everybody listening would agree it's their mindset. Uh, you know, you take away everything else and keep their mindset and they'll probably regain a good part of it. Um, and so if you believe your mindset is the most important thing you have, then my question for you is simple. What mindset do you have and where did you get it? And what mindset do you want to have and how do you shape it? And we started this conversation by talking about uh, chat GPT and AI uh, and a lot of current AIs are neural nets. Um, and you train a neural net by showing it uh, example after example, image after image, right? And chat GPT is a large language model uh, based on GPT-3 and gpt 3.5, whatever. And it was those large language models were trained on data from the internet. So our brains are neural nets and our brains are, uh, are shaped by what we show it every day. And so I ask entrepreneurs and, and folks that, you know, are in my, my conversations, like, what are you training your neural net with? Uh, if it's like most people, uh, it's on CNN, you know, the crisis news network, and you're watching every murder, every despot, every crooked politician in your living room over and over and over again, like every 10 minutes. And it's like, stop, I don't want to see this stuff. I don't want this. You know, it's not to say it's not true, but it's not balanced for what's going on in the world, right? If you think about what is the business model of a, of a newspaper or a, uh, a television news show, its business model is to deliver your eyeballs to their advertisers. And we pay 10 times more attention to negative news than positive news. So as a result of that, we are bluntly just being bombarded by negative news so we don't turn off our TV and they can sell us stuff. And, you know, listen- it's tra Training the neural net. It's crazy, right? And, and so I, I choose to not do that. I choose what I read carefully. I choose what conversations I have, like the one we're having now. Mm -hmm. um, 
I built, I think you're, you're familiar with this. I built an AI engine that scans the world's news and generates custom newsletters um, for, uh, for folks to uh, get information that is highly validated uh, and highly positive semantic. I trained one around longevity. I call it longevityinsider.org. Folks can go there for free. And every day I get the top 10 to 15 articles on breakthroughs around longevity. And so if I'm watching these breakthroughs and reading about, and the, the AI gives you a, a, a paragraph summary of the article, the link to the article and, a, and an image, and it's great because it just, I'm training my neural net with like, wow, that's an amazing breakthrough. Wow, that's an amazing breakthrough. Wow, that's an amazing breakthrough. And it gives you a uh, much different perspective on life. I, I absolutely love that perspective because, you know, we, we have a lot of heuristics around, you know, you are what you eat and we have all these sort of like, one-liners to describe how what we ingest is important. And I don't even know that we take those that seriously, but the information diet conversation, which is increasingly being had, I think, thankfully, is such an important one because exactly like you said, I mean, look at what, look at what we do when we train a neural net with information. Now, we, it can be an incredibly capable tool, but we can see that we can bias it very quickly by just having it ingest information of a certain source. And, and what we've done, I think, with ourselves is we've, we've biased towards stress and pessimism. Um, and unfortunately it's a hard one to get out of, but I think the things, the tools that, that work best for me are conversations like this. I, I have, I, I see the most inspiration, um, in, in my own mindset when I am around people who have, all, you know, are, are a few steps further along the, the route towards a mindset of, of optimism, especially around technology. Um, what else is there? You know, what, what do you recommend for people who are, currently feeling that they do not have the mindset that it would take to, to, to be positive about the future? So great question. I mean, listen, the things that train your mindset are what you watch, uh, what's on your walls, uh, what you listen to, who you hang out with to a large degree, right? So, um, you know, choose your podcast carefully. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I invite folks to moonshots and mindsets. And obviously, the whole new level that we're uh, in today. What you read is important. Um, there's incredible books in the whole longevity world. You know, David Sinclair wrote a book uh, called um, Lifespan, which was excellent. Tony Robbins and I wrote a book last year called Life Force. Um, and uh, uh, Mark Hyman has a book coming out. There's a whole bunch of, of great books out there. Uh, and then uh, you know, you're the average of the people you spend the most time with. So who in your community is super positive and has a mindset that you want to emulate? And how do you spend more time with them? I mean, that's basically it uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And then what I tell people is don't watch the news. You don't need to. You honestly do not need to. I will look at Google News um, for 10 minutes uh, mm -hmm. to figure out, is there something going on in the world I need to know about? And I, you know, my mom calls me when there's something that I need to know about as well. Otherwise, I'm not going to, you could, they could never pay me enough to watch the evening news or, or read these papers. I mean, if you it's, pick up tomorrow's newspaper and you count the number of positive stories and negative stories, right? It's 10 to one negative to positive minimum, if not yeah. worse. Yeah. I've, I've been on a no news diet myself since really since starting the, the company and, um, just not, not really, it started off with just not having the time and realizing how, where my attention was going. And then it's, it's sort of translated into a recognition that the quality of the information is, is proportional to, or probably, you know, yeah, there's a multiplier here to the amount of time it takes to produce. This is something that my co-founder Sam talks about is that, you know, a book takes a lot of time. Somebody invested thousands of hours to pull that information together and synthesize it. And podcasts take, take many hours and, um, you know, movies and, and things like this, but, Something that doesn't take a lot of time is breaking news that is intended to really just generate clicks for advertising. That is something that is specifically not, you know, there's this Lindy effect concept where the longer something is around, the more likely it is to stay around. Well, you know, the news cycle we have is less than 24 hours. And so keeping that information, uh, just keeping your guard up and the filter strong for the information you're bringing in. You know, for me, I don't need any news platforms on my phone because, uh, 
I have conversations and people filter out the information that's most relevant or most important. And a lot of it ends up, you know, I, I will know about things like a fusion energy net, net demonstration <laughs> without needing the news app. Um, on the people side of this, what's really interesting there is, is that it's, it's information sources you can get without any human sort of interaction. But then there are the people that you're surrounded with and you choose to interact with. Um, Elon used to talk about, Elon Musk used to talk about people as vectors and everyone has a vector and they're basically, you know, it's a, a vector is, is basically a line with direction. It's like, you've got, you know, basically you're moving in a direction specifically. And if a vector isn't aligned, basically if a person is not aligned with the direction that you're trying to move in, they're, they're moving you in, in a non-parallel direction. So that's a little bit of a complicated way to describe it, but essentially it's like, Elon would select for people whose vectors were pointed in the same direction. He, he didn't spend a lot of time trying to change people's minds. It was, you either understand why we're here, what we're trying to accomplish, or you either understand the inherent value in what we're describing, or I'm going to find someone who does. Yes. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at here is how do you select for people you work with? Does that resonate with you? Is that a hundred percent? Yeah. It's, it's like, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, especially, um, the people in my, in my organization, it's like I'm clear that uh, that we have a massive transformative purpose. And I one of the things I teach at Abundance 360 and I talk about in my books and, you know, Abundance, Bold and the Future is Fast. And you think of the three books that sort of are around these mindsets is the most successful companies on the planet have a clear MTP, a massive transformative purpose. And it's set early on by the founder or founders. And the goal is to hire people that are on board in that vector, that MTP. It's clear what we're doing, why we're doing it, and where we're going. And um, if you disagree with, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it, where we're going, then this is probably not the right place for you to work because you're unlikely to change it. Now, um, when you're in the organization uh, and you're helping make that that future happen. Yeah. New data comes along and the organization can, can move its, uh, its vector slightly, but I've never seen, uh, a company where the vector, you know, moves 90 degrees, a few degrees. Yes. If mm -hmm. it's, if it's moving that dramatically, then it's probably falling apart. Yeah. That's, you know, I, I think when people are trying to figure out where to where to look for inspiration, who to, who to work with, or or who to bring on to a team if you're building a team. Um, yeah, this one's it's tricky because you, there are so many people who have credentials and have obvious capability and are super intelligent. But this element of of sort of vector pointing and trying to change someone's mind, I, I like what you said. You like to change mindsets, not not minds. I think an organization has a mindset, and uh, a team has a mindset, and uh, if you're counter to that mindset, uh, you're going to be a lot of wasted energy. Um, and it's, uh, you know, when I've, when I hire a new member on my team, I typically have a, a 90 day rule, which is mm. come in, do the best you can. I'll do the best I can for you. And in 90 days, if it's not working, you leave. And so at the end of the day, what I'm looking for during that 90 day period is when this person is in the room and they're talking, do I wish they'd shut up? <laughs> you know, it's like, yep. I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear <laughs> what you have to say and so forth. That's a, not a good sign. On the other hand, if they're in the room and I'm not hearing their opinion and I want it, you know, that can be trained up. It's like, you know, I want to hear your opinion. And mm -hmm. I've, you know, it's been always true for me because mindsets align and those vectors align in that in that way and so uh yeah i think some of the rules are don't jump in someplace expecting to change it uh, as well as um uh, you know if you're if you know what your strength is and you know what your weakness are focus on doubling down on your strengths and not trying to improve your weaknesses yeah i like i, I like that you know the, the focus uh, same goes for companies and organizations just s stay focused on the things that that you're good at um, of course, you need to get better at the things you're not. Uh, I think it's, you can't do everything. And so, you know, if you're, 
the world's best machine coder, but you're lousy at writing, I'd rather have you be even better machine coding and I'll hire a writer to compliment you or I'll mm -hmm. hire chat GPT to compliment you. <laughs> I was just going to say it. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that, that's awesome advice. And I think the, the 90 day rule, you know, it's, it's mutual. If, if people don't feel, you know, I, I think people need to feel more ownership over where they are, who they're surrounded by, what teams they join. And, um, and, you know, really, I, I think there's a, there's no benefit to languishing somewhere. If you don't feel like you're being heard and no one wants to hear you, um, there are places that will. That is so true in any kind of relationship that, you know, fire fast and hire slowly. Yeah. yeah. Love it. I want to circle back to, in, in the last few minutes, healthcare, because we haven't talked about it yet. And I know we both have strong opinions and I remember, I think this was 2012 timeframe, but there was an X prize announced for a tricorder competition. Mm -hmm. And the tricorder is a device from Star Trek, which is, it's capable of doing basically the most magical things about interpreting uh, disease state, understanding the health of, of an individual essentially. And the, this tool, the announcement, I, I remember it pretty vividly. I don't remember the details exactly, but it was intended to, to uh, create innovation in the space, create a new device that is capable of detecting, uh, I think diagnosing uh, and understanding some some biomarkers in, in an individual and a human, and that that prize was won. But what stuck with me is that it it was so surprising to me at that time that this device didn't exist already. That you didn't have a handheld thing that could take biomarkers and and diagnose. I just felt like, huh, having had no exposure to healthcare, I would hope that that sort of thing was already in the hands of doctors. And flash forward to now. I'd love to get an update from you on how you see health monitoring. Um, how, how is it? You've talked a lot about nanotechnology, tiny technology yeah. that is ingestible, uh, measuring analytes through devices like tricorders, uh, wearables. W where do you see us right now on the on the monitoring side? Because it's it's upstream of understanding and being able to intervene. Yeah, I think we're. I just published a blog on uh, one of the meta trends on the um, on the trillion sensor economy that's coming. That we're mm -hmm basically entering a world where everything is knowable 24 seven. And if everything is knowable, then it's the quality of the questions you ask, not what you know, that's, that's important. And I think this is gonna be true for medicine to a large degree. And the meta trend that is coming in the field is moving medicine out of the hospital and out of the doctor's office into the home, into the body. Right. So we have, you know, I've got my Apple watch. I have my aura ring. You can't see I'm wearing my levels right here. It is my levels, uh, uh, uh CGM. And I have a, uh, a little RFID chip, radio frequency ID chip, uh, embedded here, which I did on the stage in Amsterdam years ago. It has my business card on it, but eventually it, this subcutaneous device will be measuring different, uh, micro RNAs or, vitamins in my bloodstream and so forth. But we're going to head towards a world where these sensors on our body, in our body, in our clothing, in the chair of our desk, in our beds are monitoring everything 24 seven and all of it's being ingested into an AI that is looking for slight little clues, right? I think the ultimate tricorder is a myriad of sensors that are in our environment. Um, audio assistants like Alexa or Google Now and, and Siri and so forth uh, are able to listen to the quality of your voice or if you cough, what the cough sounds like. And all of this is massive data that's going to be uh, plowing into, you know, 24 seven diagnostics. So I think this is the decade that we completely reinvent healthcare. I think it's ready for massive disruption. And so we're going to be doing that with healthcare. It's going to make it available to everyone and it's going to be a lot more efficient. And as all the data is aggregated and it begins to, we begin to learn from it. Um, it's just going to accelerate how fast things are moving. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I certainly believe and uh, want to see as an individual, but also as someone who, who feels like the incentives are broken. I want to see the individual become responsible for and empowered to own their healthcare. And I think there are ways, I'm, I'm really excited about the Trillion Sensor future and about moving from uh, the hospital into the home. 
but I'm curious if you have any thoughts, uh, sort of a, cl a closing thought here on incentives specifically and what we need to look out for in, in this fast moving future that we're entering. Um, how do we make sure that we end up with a world where we're not being sold, you know, tar more targeted advertisements based on our bio, yeah. bio market? So we are going to have that in our future and we're going to have the pros and cons. I think we're going to have an AI that you can use to filter through that and shield things for you, right? Um, in the interim, we have humans that do that. If you're able to have a great executive assistant um, uh, who filters your emails and shows you which ones are important, eventually your AI will cross correlate, every, you know, knows what you want, knows who's in your database, knows who's a, a known, uh, uh, you know, spammer and mm -hmm. can can filter that stuff for you. But mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be the combination of, of AI uh, and a massive increase in sensors that are transforming all of this. Uh, and it's coming fast. Um, and there are gonna be a lot more wow moments uh, in, the, in the years ahead. Uh, you know, the idea of the singularity, which Ray talked about is the moment in time when uh, the speed of change is so fast that it's impossible to predict what comes next. Uh, and you know, his, his date is early 2040s for that, which isn't too far away. That's 20 years from now. Um, but it's going to be faster and faster and faster. Well, Ray is a, a great person to check out. And in this last question, I, I would love to hear who else is out there that people should be paying attention to who are, whether they're particularly prescient, knowledgeable, especially maybe the people that, most don't know about who are doing amazing things out there. Sure. I mean, uh, dear friend, Salim Ismail is, uh, the head of exponential organizations. Um, uh, he was the first president of singularity university. So his group is called EXO works. EXO is exponential organizations. Um, Mark Hyman is doing a lot of incredible work in the bio, uh, medical space. Um, I mean, there are, just a, a multitude of, of folks. Um, I don't know where to start, honestly. <laughs> I'm caught sort of flat-footed on that. Start with, um, with Peter's RSS feed of, of the optimistic longevity articles of the future. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I hope, uh, hope folks will, will check out um, uh, longevityinsider.org. I think uh, you'll enjoy it. It's free. It's a public service just to get people to understand what's coming because it's an extraordinary future ahead.